Galoon's been hacking on the networking for quite some time, uh, looking after Google's interests as well as Upstream's interests as well. Um, he's been doing a lot of work with UDP from zero copy to his present work on GSO, facing all other good stuff. Probably influenced by Quick in some way, some of the work that he's doing on, just to guess. <laughs> and uh, really appreciate all the work that it, contributions he does, and uh, take it away. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Let's quickly see how much time I actually have. I think it's half an hour, right? Okay, excellent. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, let's have a look at some uh, recent UDP uh, stack optimizations, uh, specifically for delivering content across the internet at scale. And as uh, David alluded to, this work is inspired by Quick. Now, this is not a talk about Quick. So at the bottom, you can see two links to uh, recent Quick uh, presentations and, and papers. Uh, what's relevant here is that it's a, a reliable transport protocol on top of UDP that showed some qualitative benefits when um, um, we converted Google egress traffic from TCP to Quick. And um, about that number that I quote is the, the most recent number I saw but it's actually higher than, I think, 35% these days of Google egress, that is egressing over Quick instead of over TCP. And um, it's, that's growing. The majority of Google egress, unsurprisingly, I think, is uh, YouTube uh, traffic. So that's actually a pretty sizable fraction of the internet. Um, so it, converting to Quick gave some qualitative benefits, but it actually came with a pretty big cost, which is at some point a 3x, and, and more recently a 2x higher cycle cost per byte sent. So when you have a, like a cool new experimental protocol, that's quite acceptable. But once you reach this, this scale, um, obviously uh, it's not acceptable. So the, the impetus for this talk really is how can we reduce this cycle cost? Where does it come from? Um, one thing to keep in mind is that these kind of production loads is not just op um, optimizing a, you know, net for a few to be stream. In practice, these servers are much more powerful than their cloud clients. So it's quite likely to have thousands of concurrent connections to various clients across the wide area network, each relatively small, right? One megabyte per second, and you'll see later why I use bytes instead of bits here. Um, so Quick is no longer only used at Google. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of interest outside. There's also, uh, it's going through IETF standardization. So one um, a potential idea here could be like, well, why don't we just re-implement it in the kernel? And maybe that will uh, make it more efficient. But I actually uh, didn't want to do that uh, because that will only benefit Quick, not the next Quick or whatever e uh, protocol. And it's actually particularly relevant because there already are multiple versions of Quick itself. There's GQuick, <coughs> often called, which is the Google version, and iQuick, the IETF uh, standardized version, which is quite different. So instead, uh, what we're going to focus on is optimizing the UDP stack for these kind of protocols. Uh, UDP is often used for protocols that require uh, timely delivery more than reliable delivery. But even for reliable uh, protocols, it's nice because it's available across operating systems without super user privileges. Um, middle boxes don't leave it alone, but at least leave it alone a little bit more than um, non-TCP or UDP protocols. And uh, it's, it's very extensible. So then the question basically becomes if we're going to optimize UDP, like why was Quick 2x uh, more expensive? Is this in user space or is this in the kernel? So we're going to ignore the quick server for now and instead um, look at a micro benchmark that is in the kernel source tree. Uh, this was, uh, I merged this along with the UDP segmenta uh, segmentation offload patches. Um, what we're looking at here is basically sending, uh, saturating a 10 gigabit NIC on a, some re reasonably modern machine. Uh, the details of this test and other tests are all in the paper. I'm going to gloss over some for expediency. And what we see is that um, so sending 10 gigabits of traffic over TCP, um, if we measure system-wide cycles with PERF, takes about 600 uh, uh, million cycles per second. Uh, with UDP, it's almost a factor of five higher. Um, so it's pretty clear that this 5x cost is a big contributor to the 2x cost in the quick server as a whole. And if we look at the number of system calls made by these applications, that's a pretty big indication that, you know, that might be part of the problem here. So a naive solution might be like, well, let's just use send a message and batch the number of system calls and then 
we'll, you know, we'll solve this problem. Uh, but if you look at a perf um, trace, um, a perf re report, then it, it's pretty, I don't have that here, but it's, you'll see that there's not a single hotspot, right? It's not just the system calling, even with all these sort of um, um, specter and meltdown mitigations. It's really just a cruise across the stack, and the real issue is that we have to send all these datagrams that are uh, MTU sized across the stack, whereas TCP does not. So um, we can actually validate that intuition. If we look at TCP uh, without the TCP segmentation offload, um, with eTool you can disable TSO, <coughs> and I'll, I'll I assume most people know what the segmentation offload is, but I'll go into it a little bit later. But basically, um, with TCP TSO, the network card will split up large buffers into smaller ones and send those out. So we can send larger packets to the network card. If we turn off TSO, it falls back onto a kernel implementation <coughs> of the same mechanism, GSO. And we can see that um, basically the number of system calls s stays the same, but the cost of sending it in cycles um, is, uh, goes up at about threefold. Uh, and then if we turn off segmentation offload completely, also the in kernel version, uh, TCP is actually no faster than UDP or no more efficient than UDP in this case. So um, this is a good hint that if we add segmentation offload to UDP, uh, we can reap the same kind of benefits. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about how to do this and how you can use this. And also a couple of um, related features that are new in the kernel that uh, actually all of these together help us uh, improve the, the quick server and servers like that. I, I should point out that this is not nearly all my work. Um, so thanks to everyone who worked on the UDP stack recently um, in, in these changes. If you're interested in who did what, uh, the paper has more details on this as well. All right, so segmentation offload. The idea is pretty straightforward. If the cost of the kernel stack transmission accrues by having to go through the stack many times for a given uh, payload, then let's build larger packets. And we basically can ignore the uh, packet size on the wire to a certain extent and have a virtual uh, MTU size that's larger within the kernel and, and with TCP segmentation offload even to the network card, right? So normally with datagrams, um, you have to send a datagram that um, fits on the wire, often this is Ethernet 1500 bytes, so you subtract the headers, this is IPv6, and that's the payload you can send in each system call. With um, the maximum um, MTU size allowed by IPv6, it's 45 times as large, so you cut the um, traversals 45x, and you, know, you might get a 5x in, uh, redu reduction in overall cycles. That's the idea. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that <coughs> TCP, the contract with the application is a byte stream. So uh, the kernel has much more leeway in how it splits up that and sends it on the network than with uh, UDP. UDP, the, the datagram is supposed to arrive at the, at the receiver the same way that the sender um, uh, sent it out. So um, drive home the point. Normally, um, an application will have to send datagrams one by one, possibly with an M message. They go through the stack one at a time, and um, they're sent out one at a time. With UDP GRO, the interface changes, uh, sorry, GSO, the interface changes, so the application, and we'll look at that, it's not a very complicated change, but the application now sends a larger packet knowingly that this is, uh, contains multiple payloads together. And um, with GSO, the kernel will still split it up and pass it to the NIC uh, exactly as if the application would have sent individual packets. And with um, um, hardware offload, it's actually the NIC that does this, uh, but of course, we need drivers that support this. Um, this all might sound very familiar, and, and we've had UDP fragmentation offload in the kernel for a while. UFO, however, is um, mostly gone, uh, which I'm quite happy about. Uh, but also, it's not transparent in the way that um, GSO is. So with UDP fragmentation offload, an application explicitly configures a socket to bypass the MTU limits, as builds a larger packet and relies on IP to fragment this and send the fragments out on the network. These fragments can take different paths on the network, and they take extra costs on the recipient, on the receiver, to uh, reassemble the larger datagram. So there are a number of issues with this. Segmentation, what we do is the application sends 
multiple payloads. They um, are taken as a single datagram. So they get one IP header or IPv6 header, one UDP header. They go down the stack, and at some point in the network card or just be be before, the payloads are split up and the, the headers are replicated. So they all get the same header, which you can do because they all have the same you know, source and destination. They all have the same TTL. They all have the same toss. Um, so you, with segmentation, we end up building exactly the same stream of datagrams that we would have built had an application just issued multiple I individual send calls um, of MTU size. So that's, that's the powerful part. It's transparent to the network and, and to the receiver. Um, so how do you use this? Um, basically, all that's required when sending this larger packet is signaling to the kernel that you're well aware that this thing exceeds MTU, and that's fine. Or I should say MSS, and that's fine. And um, all segments are the same size, and, and though that segment size is smaller than or equal to MSS, and the kernel should split it up among uh, this segment size. So there are two ways to do this, either with the set sock opt that um, uh, remains associated with the socket, the, the, this, this uh, setting, or with the control message um, at send message time. And the buffer does not need to be an exact multiple of GSO size. If it isn't, then the last segment will be shorter than the others. All right, so does this actually help is the obvious next question. And uh, it does, it seems in this benchmark. So this is uh, the benchmark extended with UDP GSO. And we see that the uh, cycles per second is comparable to TCP GSO speed up slightly better, but you know, the numbers aren't very precise. Uh, so that's encouraging. And then the obvious next question is, well, this is all nice and good, but TCP TSO is much better. So um, what does UDP, I kind of call it TSO, because that's TCP segmentation offload. Um, I guess a large segmentation offload is, is the nice inverse of large receive offload. So I don't have numbers for this, but um, to my surprise, within two weeks of um, this patch shit getting merged, um, Alexander Dijk, um sent an RFC patch for the Intel IXGB driver. And uh, not much later, the Mellanox folks um, su submitted a patch that's uh, merged for the MLX5 driver. And this summer, uh, Boris Bismani uh, presented some results, which are uh, very much in line with TCP TSO. So if I recall correctly, it's about a 2x, um, uh, like a 50% increase in throughput versus GSO at half the cycle. So that's, uh, that's you know, an impressive improvement, 6x. So we'll see, um, as I said, um, I don't have data myself, but those numbers are very encouraging to use a GSO and to, uh, to reduce that quick gap. Now what's interesting is once we do this, obviously the cost across the stack is much lower than it was before. And now if you look at a perf trace, which again, I don't have a slide, um, we'll see that there's actually one hotspot appears and it's a very common one or a very familiar one. Sorry, I missed a few slides. Um, we'll get to that later. Uh, first though, if we do hardware offload, there's an interesting problem, which is, as I said, um, these uh, segment uh, segmented packets, the GSO packets, need not be a perfect multiple of GSO size. <coughs> if they are, you can just replicate the IP and the UDP headers. If, if they aren't, um, then the length fields need to be updated. And that is something that's you know, more complex, especially to do in firmware. So device drivers that don't support this um, can still use uh, G, um, TSO or LSO in this case um, with a, a very nice, elegant solution to this problem that Alexander Dijk implemented uh, long before UDP GSO, more in the context of tunnel, uh, tunnel offload, which is GSO partial. So if you look at the packet on the right, um, it basically uh, cannot be offloaded to hardware because some uh, fields in the header need to be updated. With GSO partial, um, this packet will go into the GSO layer in the kernel. It will split it into not 45 seg segments, which it would normally do if you had to apply GSO instead of TSO. It splits it into two. One that's a perfect multiple of uh, GSO size, still a GSO packet. It passes that to the NIC and it will split it into 44 uh, seg segments. And one that's a non-GSO packet that has all its headers updated by the kernel. I think it's a very, very mm -hmm. nice optimization. And this is transparent, so device drivers don't have to worry about this or, or implement it themselves. There's some other constraints if, if you want to use this. 
So how to choose GSO size? It is really the same choice that you make without a GSO on how to choose the send buffer size because it follows the same rules. So um, the lazy choice is sort of the, the device MTU, often ETH data land. The realistic choice is you have to know the path MTU. And especially for workloads like a quick server where we have many connections uh, basically over a few unconnected sockets, it's likely that you pass the GSO size as a C message with ETH datagram depending on the path MTU of that particular flow. <coughs> um, the number of segments, so the one, ideally all the data that's outstanding, you would pass to the kernel in one gigantic buffer and, and, and have to deal with it. There is an upper limit uh, because it, it has a virtual high MTU, but it still has to be an IP or an IPv6 packet. So 64 kilobytes uh, is the upper limit. Uh, we add in another constraint, which is 64 is the max number. And the reason for this is that there's no constraint on how small the GSO size can be. So if the GSO size is one byte, I didn't want an unprivileged application to be able to burst 64K packets on the wire by building a large packet with the smallest GSO size. And finally, there's a constraint that I, I guess with a patch we can just fix this, but um, a GSO packet that's uh, smaller than the GSO size will get dropped, and that's not a UDP specific issue, but you have to be careful that if you set GSO size <coughs> to set sock opt and send datagrams that are both larger than GSO size, but also you yeah, one that's smaller, the smaller one basically won't make it out. So don't do that. The fi final um, constraint here is in uh, the checksumming. The device has to support checksum offload. It would be possible to um, use UDP GSO in a path that does not have ch hardware checksum offload, but that basically means um, uh, ignoring the checksum that's uh, computed for the large packet at, the, at, at send, and then recomputing a new checksum in the GSO layer for each packet. And that's just incre incredibly expensive. It's much cheaper to do the checksum and copy optimization if you know that there is no hardware offload. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we just um, hard fill UDP GSO and you have to uh, fall back onto normal transmission. Shouldn't be a problem in any like real server environment, of course. All right, so now we get to the, there are actually another optimization that um, I worked on a, a while ago. This uh, patch that originally included a UDP uh, uh, option, and I dropped it from the patch set because there was no way I could make a zero copy effective with UDP. So what this version of zero copy does is um, it uh, basically replaces copying with page pinning and a notification from the kernel back up to user space for each send call when data um, has been sent out. So it's not free in any, uh, by any means. And because it's a per cent cost compared to a per byte cost for copying, the bigger the buffer is, the more benefit you get from this optimization. And with 1500 bytes or 1472 byte UDP uh, buffers, we basically saw no benefit. Um, now that we have UDP GSO, when we can actually send 64 kilobyte um, UDP payloads, um, zero copy becomes a viable um, opt optimization. This was a slide from the zero copy talk a while ago, uh, where we saw that with TCP stream, if you just look at the process cycles, four out of five cycles were uh, spent copying, a pretty good indication that, that this is worth optimizing. Um, I should point out again, these are process cycles. These do not include like interrupts, handling, and so. So all the other numbers in this talk are actually system-wide cycles, which are much more representative of true cost. Um, so now if we like, revisit basically this data, but for the benchmark, the UDP GSO bench TX that we've been looking at, we can see that if we don't do zero copy yet, we can actually look with perf how much time system-wide is spent copying. And with the TCP case, it was a quarter. So that's kind of your upper, upper bound on what you can benefit from zero copy. With UDP, it's only 3%. So there's obviously not you know, a lot of opportunity there. So that explains why UDP zero copy was not very effective previously. Now, if we actually look at TCP without TSO and without GSO, which spend more time in the stack and less time in copying as a result, uh, we can see that, that those two have less opportunity. Um, so that also leads that with UDP GSO spending less time in the stack, it probably spends more time copying, and indeed it does. Um, the benchmark was not really meant for zero copy, uh, so I added, a, it, it rotates the same buffer over and over and over again, so it's, it's warm in the cache. 
so I added a version that rotates buffers, the cache thrashing variant, and then we spend a little bit more time in copying. So this uh, kind of is the upper bound of what we can achieve with zero copy and V2P GSO. And if you look at um, when I reapplied the zero copy patch set, we can indeed see that the cycle cost for GSO and GSO cache thrashing variant are the same with zero copy. We don't care at this point that it's cold or hot data because we're not touching it. And the speed up uh, versus copying goes up. Now here the same applies uh, really as with um, GSO in general that with LSO, I hope that we can approach the numbers from TCP TSO because we're doing even less in the stack and even more, uh, spend more time copying. So this, uh, this patch is not um, uh, merged yet, but I think I'm gonna try to resubmit it. Um, with all this fast um, transmission, we actually run into another problem that's not GSO specific, but it's even more relevant with GSO, which is, as I said, these workloads, server workloads sent to many uh, clients at the same time. Uh, so we need to send at a rate that the client uh, is, is capable of receiving. If you send too fast, particularly with UDP, this is of course easy to do, it just cause a lot of drops. So we need to pace the traffic. And so far the quick server paces in user space, which means that it has to um, wake up the process, suffer a lot of um, um, system call, also, yeah, system call cost, context switching, you know, cold caches and such. So again, the idea is more, we, the application can send a lot of data to the kernel and let the kernel handle the efficient delivery of it. And that's what we do with, with pacing offload. So drive home the point. If, even if we don't think of pacing and just send packets at whatever is the natural latency incurred by going through the stack for every send, once you have GSO, this actually is a much uh, more compressed uh, transmission. So it, it, it becomes a bigger problem with the GSO. But the issue itself is that this bursty traffic increases drops on the, on the wire. Um, for a reliable transfer protocol, that means that there are more retransmissions, and retransmissions just mean more cycles. So if we send very, very fast, we actually you know, make it more expensive to send data. Um, this particular use case, as I said, about um, these one megabyte um, per second clients, we can send that data um, in 100 microseconds, and it's pretty, you can be assured that this does not arrive at the client, right? So instead, the idea of pacing is to send at a l small time scale at the same rate as we send at a large time scale. And the time scale for practical purposes, I guess, is uh, one millisecond. So instead of sending one megabyte and round robining to the next, actually send one kilobyte and then you know, do the same for all, for the, all the other uh, clients. Um, instead of waking up the process every millisecond to do this, which is very expensive, um, the kernel has had support for offloading this to the QDIS layer for a long time. And so max spacing rate is a way to basically say for a connected socket for a flow at what rate that flow can, uh, data from that flow can be dequeued from the QDISC. Uh, that requires uh, FQ um, uh, to, to, so not every QDISC basically checks the, the pacing rate. The issue with ma uh, SOMX spacing rate for quick traffic for unconnected sockets is that it, rely, it requires a connection. Uh, this summer, a different interface was added, SOTX time. And this allows uh, associating a delivery time with each individual datagram. So similar to how with uh, UDP GSO, we can associate a GSO size with each datagram over connected, unconnected sockets. Uh, with SOTX time, basically the application signals that it wants to use it on the socket. It then uh, computes a time in the future in uh, nanoseconds in, a, in the tie clock base and just associates it with a control message, passes it to the kernel, and the kernel um, with the right QDISC again, which is um, uh, the new QDISC that was um, added here or with FQ, <coughs> um, the QDISC will hold the data until it's ready to, to release. So the application needs to basically have fewer wake seconds <coughs> and more data at once. Um, one particular issue with GSO that we're running into right now, and I'm not sure exactly, I think I have plenty of time, but we're getting into the future work part here, or the open issues, is that there are conflicting goals. With GSO, we try to send as much as possible into the kernel, but with pacing, we try to actually send out 
like very little in small uh, intervals. And if it's one megabyte, and this is why I use bytes here, one kilobyte uh, per millisecond means less than one MSS. So we basically cannot use GSO if we want to send out this size datagram uh, every millisecond. And I think uh, what we're going to need is a, a, some kind of interface that allows passing a GSO SKB with a GSO size and a uh, TX time and some kind of like fractional TX time that says every subsequent segment should be sent so many nanoseconds or jiffies or whatever later than the previous one uh, and break up the segment in the, in the kernel layer. In, in theory, we can already basically do GSO on a virtual device so that it, we segment and then have the sec individual segments queued on a, on a physical NIC. Uh, but this is pretty much an open uh, issue. To point out that it's, it's relevant, um, we, uh, we did an ex early experiment with the existing Quick server which does not use UDP GSO. Um, that's recently implemented, but this was the version without. without. And that does user space um, pacing. And we increase the pacing interval. So when you increase the pacing interval, you basically send slightly more bursty traffic. And as you can expect, the loss rate goes up when you do this. But the CPU time uh, spent in the application went down quite tremendously. So the CPU time went down even though we had to retransmit more data. At some point, the two will probably even each other out. Also, we don't want to inflict this on the network. So there are, you know, there's a question, what's a reasonable choice here? Uh, probably eight is reasonable, particularly if you keep in mind that the loss rate is from a very low base. Uh, but this is sort of a short-term hack. This is not a real solution. Um, yeah. So, all right. Actually, if, uh, I'm talking faster than I thought. So I, I thought I would not have time for this. Um, and also, um, the obvious sort of inverse of GSO is on the send path, is to do this batching on the receive path with UDP GRO. <coughs> this I suggested uh, when I, when I um, submitted this talk as like that would be pretty cool future work to add this as well and maybe I'll get around to like a pat RFC patch head by the time of the, of the conference. And in the meantime, uh, Paolo Albani actually implemented all of it and merged it last week. So um, that's, that was really impressive. Um, I'm just going to show you so that you know that you can use it. Um, GRO, you know, is not is new to UDP, but it's not new as a feature. Obviously, it's it's been around for a while, and it has a couple of purposes. It's if it's implemented carefully, it's the perfect inverse of GSO. And what that means is that if in a, if you um, packets that come in, datagrams that come in, um, are coalesced into larger packets, and they when they're forwarded, um, they go to the GSO layer, which segments them again. So from an observer <coughs> on the network, it should be invisible whether packets were um, coalesced and then split up within the host. Um, they are exactly the same as when we don't use this feature. The only difference is that we can uh, batch the number of uh, IP traversals by up to 45 times. Um, so for the forwarding plane, that's very useful. For local delivery, we have another problem that um, as I said, datagrams actually, unlike TCP, um, that message boundary has to be maintained. So we cannot just coalesce these packets and pass them to, a, to an application and be done with it. Applications have to be aware that these are larger packets. So they have to basically opt in to receiving GRO uh, assembled packets. That we'll see in the next slide. What Paolo did, which was really nice, is to show that um, Basically, if, if you don't have, if you have applications that don't opt into this feature, um, you, you, you basically either cannot apply GRO, which requires a socket lookup early on to figure out whether this or there is a socket and whether it has the feature. Um, but um, even if you do that, if you do a socket lookup at the GRO layer and you find that, well, there's a socket that's willing to receive GRO packets, let me assemble GRO packets. By the time that packet goes to the stack, the packet might have gone through a NAT layer or so, and the actual packet has changed, and the socket lookup at the high layer is actually different. And now it arrives at a socket that does not, uh, is not capable of GRO, and now you have a problem, right? You cannot pass this, this uh, um, packet. So my solution was just to drop it, but I admit that that's not a very nice one. He had a very much nicer one, which is to um, apply segmentation as if you're in the forwarding plane, split it up and pass these uh, segmented packets up to uh, the application. 
So that, how, that works in all cases. Now the open question is, do we still need the socket lookup early in the stack to figure out whether uh, we can deliver large packets or should we just always apply GRO and in the case where we get to the socket and it cannot accept GRO packets, just segment on demand. And the, 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 that depends really on whether it is more efficient to do batching plus segmentation versus not doing it at all. And I think we need more data to that. Uh, one potential optimization that Stefan Klosser suggested was uh, using uh, frag list based segmentation instead of building upon SKB with frags because that's basically a chain of SKB so they're much cheaper to, uh, to split up. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically the current, the current situation is that we do a socket lookup and um, segmentation only in the case where it turned out that the, the original socket lookup in the GRO layer was different from the final socket lookup. Um, I want to make one more point uh, on this batching in the receive path. Another really cool patch of this, uh, this summer from Edward Cree, which was not um, batching within a flow the way GRO does it, but really just batching SKBs that come in from whatever flows. So the NAPI layer um, sends, uh, during each NAPI pool, a number of packets up the stack. Previously, it would send each packet individually up the stack before it sent the other one, and the stack traversal is pretty long which uh, means that this working set is quite likely to exceed the instruction cache, basically thrash the cache. So what he did, which was really neat, he went through the, all the <coughs> layers in the stack, and instead of accepting a single SKB, they now accept a list of SKBs. And so he threads a list of SKBs through NADF receive SKB and through IP receive. And as a result, each of these layers is pro processing multiple packets. So it's a working set is in the cache and is hot, and he saw about a 25% um, efficiency improvement for it is a benchmark for that. And that's just, um, you know, on top of any benefits we see from GRO. So collectively, these are, uh, um, that doesn't help just UDP, but it definitely also helps UDP and it also helps quick, obviously. Um, so how can a socket um, notify the kernel that it's willing to receive large packets? Um, set the set socket, UDP GRO, and then um, call with receive message with sufficient control data to actually read an additional uh, metadata field, which is the same GSO size field that the application passes on um, GSO and send. So now the application can, in user space, split up the payload in the discrete datagrams that it would have received otherwise. And this big question here, too, is this useful? These are not uh, results from Apollo's patch yet. I should caution. These are basically results from my uh, an RFC that I had a long time ago. Um, but you can see that there's a significant speed up, right? The, uh, the numbers on the right column, a 1.x speed up is, uh, is really um, uh, positive. My final uh, point here is that there is a big caveat, which is um, if you send across the wide area network, the odds of receiving perfect trains of packets are pretty slim. Right? GRO is very effective within the data center. It's extremely effective in a synthetic benchmark like this. Um, on top of this, if we send across the WAN with pacing, the odds of getting uh, these bursts are even lower. On the other hand, there are some cases where it might actually, uh, uh, that might actually end up batching up. Apparently, like mobile base stations try to batch up more packets. So we'll see if this is, this is definitely useful in data center applications. We'll see how useful it is um, for the quick serving case we saw here. Uh, when I was asked to work on QUIC, actually um, the Im I immediate question was make our servers more efficient, like save costs in the data center. But a secondary question was also help uh, mobile clients you know, spend less cycles and spend less power on uh, transmission. So um, if this is useful on the client side, that is a win in itself. Um, I'll just finish up by basically saying how this changes our QUIC server. So we've had this issue for a while where the, where the quick server is really optimized um, by using whatever kernel feature we had, which meant on re this receive path, we used packet sockets with um, RX ring to get the packets into user space. But we didn't want to have to do reassembly in user space, so we also had UDP sockets for fragmented packets, and then we had <coughs> packet fan out with a BPF filter to filter out the fragments, and then SO reuse per BPF on the UDP sockets to 
uh, load balance, in both cases to load balance. And on transmit, we used um, raw sockets. And all of this requires super user privileges and is not something we really wanted to like put out on, on, on GitHub as a reference implementation. Um, so the, the, the plan is obviously with, um, if we now can use UDP sockets on both receive and on transmit. Um, and we, with SO, we use for BPF, but a much more sensible um, reference implementation of a quick server. Um, so that's it. Thank you. We have time for, for one question. So one of the things that TCP uses for pacing is really acts and limiting the amount of memory used by the socket. Right. Uh, is there any way to do that with Quick? I understand it would be challenging without. A oh, Quick has its own congestion control, right? It even uses the same congestion control protocols. <coughs> like, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll give one more. Last one. Yeah, actually, the, is there any version of Quick that supports the segmentation GSO? Um, so our internal uh, Quick server, uh, someone added it recently, and we're testing it right now. But um, I'm not sure how many Quick servers there are out there and how and many of those are open source. Okay. Ours isn't. That's all I know. And is there any plan of uh, upstreaming this change? Well, the, the feature, the kernel feature is upstream. Uh, uh, I mean in Chromium. In Quick stack. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I sometimes forget we have open source software. It is actually in Chrome. Uh, so we sh <laughs> the, the <laughs> I should be able to point you to the patch that of our Chrome adds this. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Willem.